Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. If you're just joining us, I'm Ryan Bijan, host of Cowtown Movie Classics, and our special guest this evening is film historian, author, screenwriter, and audio commentator, Mr. Steve Haberman. How are you doing tonight, Steve? I'm doing good. How about you? All right. So The Raven was a lot of fun, but we're following it up with a very tonally different type of film. It's director Robert Wise's 1945 version of Robert Louis Stevenson's The Body Snatcher. So, Steve, when this movie came out in 1945, this was a very different time uh, politically, historically, in the United States, in world history, right, just coming off of World War II. So, tonally, where does a movie like The Body Snatcher fit in within the pantheon of the great classic horror films? Well, The Body Snatcher was uh, one of the films that Val Luton produced for RKO. They hired Val Luton to be the producer of a series of low-budget horror films, and uh, they were trying to compete with Universal, but the movies had about half the budget of the Universal movies, and the Universal movies were had B-movie budgets in the 1940s. Most of them did. So Val Luton was not given a lot of money. However... Val Luton was a man of great taste, great knowledge of cinema, and a, a very literate man, a very thoughtful man, and a somewhat neurotic man. And uh, he made these very poetic horror movies. Uh, the first ones were in contemporary settings, and they were informed by the sadness, the melancholy that the whole world uh, was experiencing because of World War II. World War II was a massive, horrible event in human history, hopefully never re uh, repeated. And when men were drafted to go to fight in Europe and in the Pacific for World War II, only every, I'd say two out of three came home. So, you know, families would proudly display uh, silver stars in their windows if their fathers or brothers or sons uh, had gone off to war had been drafted it wasn't a volunteer army it was a it was a conscription army um and american citizens going about their lives would see those silver stars in the windows turning to gold stars and what the gold star meant was that that father son brother had been killed and so death was very real a real element of of life if you will in in america and around the world really so Val Luton was making these movies about death, which horror movies are, and they kind of straddled the ground between uh, the occult, the supernatural, a sort of mystic reality, and the psychological. Because of movies like I Walked with a Zombie or um, Isle of the Dead, they never really came right out and said that the events were supernatural or that they were psychological. So the uh, the audience had to decide what they thought it was. Sometimes it, you know, usually because of commercial pressure, Val Luton would fall down on the supernatural on that side, like in the cat people. The cat people, you don't know whether she's crazy or whether she's really, you know, a, a possessed, but um, she's killing people, <laughs> that's for sure. And uh, so you don't know until the very end, you kind of have to believe that that the studio, with their interference, they, they put in a couple of shots that Luton didn't want, came down on the side of the supernatural. Because, you know, when they saw the movie to begin with, they weren't too happy with it. They wanted uh, something that was going to, on a lower budget, compete with the Wolfman from, from Universal. Um, and what they got was something very different, but it made a lot of money. It made a lot of money. And when you make a lot of money, then uh, you can do pretty much what you want. So Val Luton was allowed to make pictures that were very poetic and, you know, in that same vein, like I Walked with a Zombie and The Seventh Victim and The Curse of the Cat People and, and movies like that, which are wonderful. They're scary, but at the same time, they're very melancholy. And they are these kind of um, sad ruminations on death. So uh, Jack Gross was a producer at Universal. And um, RKO hired him to come over and collaborate with Luton. And Jack Gross was coming from the universal sensibility, which were monsters and horror movie stars and uh, and not the real world, you know, as, as a kind of magical Europe where there is no World War II. And we don't even know exactly what time period some of these movies are taking place in. And um, so that was not what Luton wanted, but... Uh, when he met with Boris Karloff, 
because Jack Gross insisted that they'd sign a contract with Boris Karloff so that Luton would have some star power in these movies. He was just before that he was using contract actors as as the you know as the characters in his films. So he, Jack Bro Gross uh, forced Karloff on Luton, and Luton adapted his sensibility and made it, um, uh, shall we say, more literature based. He met with Karloff. He found Karloff to be very intelligent, very literate, and somebody who really cared about the genre, which Val Luton did also. And uh, they decided that they were going to do a, 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 an adaptation of a classic. And that classic was Robert Louis Stevenson's short story. He wrote it in 1882, but it wasn't uh, it wasn't uh, published until 1884 because Stevenson was so ashamed of it. Um, the Body Snatcher. And uh, they adapted this short story. They really used the short story itself for the for the very last act. But um, they uh, uh, Luton and his screenwriter, uh, Philip McDonald, they they created a brilliant uh, act one and act two. This relationship, this uh, relationship between the Henry Daniel character, uh, Dr. McFarland, and uh, Boris Karloff's character, who's the body snatcher, um, and his name is Gray. And they, it's it's a class struggle, and it's an education struggle, and it's also a struggle of uh, a man who's trying to do good, and that's Dr. McFarland, even though he, there's something missing in his heart, and a man who doesn't know what good is, and that's the sociopath Gray, who's like many sociopaths, or I would say really symptomatic of all sociopaths, a very charming fellow. Of course, you know, yeah. he'll sing you a song, he'll tell you a joke. But, you know, if he needs money, he'll also burk you and sell your body to Dr. McFarland for his students to experiment on. So um, so the, it, it, it turned out to be one of the great one of the great horror films of the 1940s with a different sensibility than the universal films. And just for just for box office appeal as a sort of afterthought, they included a part for Bela Lugosi. And it's not a good part, but Lugosi is terrific in it. As a matter of fact, one might say that it's almost, uh, Lugosi's almost miscast, but like he did with Igor in Son of Frankenstein, he brought a surprising amount of simple-minded warmth to Joseph the Servant, but uh, he, he's quite good in it. It's just that he doesn't have a lot of screen time, yeah. unlike Igor in Son of Frankenstein, who, who steals the movie. Um, but uh but it turned out to be a great Val Luton movie, very different than the movies that he had uh, uh, done previously, Luton that is, and uh, truly one of the great horror films and, and a great literary adaptation. It's it's very much in this in the uh, school of the Roger Corman Poe films, where Corman would take a very short story by yeah. Poe and use it as the third act, and have a wonderful screenwriter like Richard Matheson or Charles Beaumont or Robert Town um, come up with Act One and Act Two to flesh out the characters and give the background and the atmosphere. And along with Corman's brilliant uh, directing technique, those, those movies are classics. And, and this movie, which was directed by no less than Robert Wise, this was Robert Wise's second directing assignment, or third actually, after Madame Fifi, um, his first being uh, Taking Over Curse of the Cat People, another Val Luton uh, horror film. And uh, he really distinguishes himself in the genre in both Curse of the Cat People and especially The Body Snatcher. And he would go on to do other genre fare, wonderful stuff like The Day the Earth Stood Still, The Haunting, Audrey Rose, all very intelligent, um, extremely well-directed studio movies in the horror genre directed by Robert Wise. Yeah. And none really, none better than The Body Snatcher. Oh, yeah. The Body Snatcher, to me, it's a masterpiece. And we basically have Val Luton to thank for Robert Wise's long, prolific career. Yeah, that's right. Well, well, Steve, thank you so much. If you're in the audience, please stick around after the film so you can hear the rest of our conversation. Without further ado, directed by Robert Wise, starring Boris Karloff, Henry Danielle, and of course, Bela Lugosi, The Body Snatcher. Uh, to me, that movie plays beautifully on the big screen with an audience. It does. It's a very modern movie. It has modern sensibilities because, you know, by by the 1940s, uh, even horror movies were becoming more naturalistic. Uh, in the 1930s, especially in the early 30s, they were very informed by German expressionism. Um, and expressionism is a kind of um, unrealistic way of portraying a psychologically 
dark and twisted world. And, um, and also in, in the thirties, the disadvantages of the beginning of sound film, you know, actors and directors were a little, some more than others uneasy with the, with, with having to talk on film. And a lot of them are very theatrical because any actor who, you know, could talk, most actors who could talk were brought up in the theatrical tr tradition and they slowly realized that you have to be much more naturalistic in acting for film. Even if visually you're, you're expressionistic, you have to be a little bit more naturalistic in your acting. Um, and by the time, you know, 1945, you, we'd had 15, 16, 17 years of, of sound film and it had become its own art and the body snatcher uh, is informed by that and benefits from that. And even though it's in a period, a remote period in, in the 1830s, um, it's presented with a lot of uh, re realistic detail. Val Luton insisted on that. He was, he was uh, very interested in history and literature. And so he made sure that, uh, you know, his movies were, had a very specific sense of place mm -hmm. and a very uh, kind of accurate uh, costuming and, and set design and, and way of speaking. And, and it comes through in the body snatcher well. And, and of course, Karloff is fantastic in it. I mean, it's truly one of his great performances. My favorite Karloff performance is not the mummy. It's not the Frankenstein monster. And it's not gray cabman gray. It's uh, in the black room a wonderful underseen movie from 1935. I highly recommend you see the Blu-ray from Mill Creek in their, uh, what's it called? Thrillers from the Vault collection. I do the commentary so you can listen to me pontificate for 90 minutes um, once you see the movie. But all, but certainly Cabman Gray is, is one of Karloff's great performances. Mm -hmm. And in the maybe Black Room? Well, um, maybe, maybe second only to The Black Room. Yeah. Well, in the Black Room, that's the one where Karloff is twins, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's a great movie. Yeah, I'll definitely have to check that one out. Um, so Val Luton was one of those very industrious producers who, as you mentioned earlier, he could make a lot with very few resources or no, not a whole lot of money. And in that way, he does foreshadow, like you said, the Corman, AIP, Edgar Allan Poe films, the works of Hammer films where these movies were made for a fraction of the budget of these bigger Hollywood productions, but the people paying to go see them on the big screen, they didn't know the difference. These are beautiful, beautiful, handsome, yeah. lavish films. Right, yeah, it's true. You, the ones you mentioned are, are, are perfect examples of that. You know, I mean, Val Luton really suffered for his art. He was a nervous wreck to begin with, very neurotic guy and with a heart condition. And uh, he suffered for the nine horror films, thrillers, dark thrillers he made for RKO. And he died at a very young age, you know, from, from, from a heart attack. But uh, you can see his dedication to these projects. You know, he, he worked on every single uh, uh, pre-production, production and post-production moment to make sure. And, and uh, he knew that, you know, if you scared them, they will come. Mm -hmm. If you make a horror movie and it frightens people, word of mouth will make it a hit. And that and that was made him successful. And not every one of his movies were a hit, but every one of them is intelligent and interesting. One of his least successful movies is, in my opinion, his best movie, which is and certainly most uh, personal, which is called The Seventh Victim, which yeah. is about a group of devil worshippers in Manhattan in the 1940s during the war. Fantastic movie. I mean, absolutely. a, a, a an incredibly disturbing meditation on mortality and um, and the meaning of life or the lack thereof. It's a very nihilistic kind of movie. And uh, you're always talking about, you know, violating the code. One of the main characters, if not the main character in the movie, commits suicide in the very last shot. Mm -hmm. That was not allowed, but he did it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's a wonderful movie. And, uh, and of course, The Body Snatcher, as you saw, as you just saw the movies, it has a very despairing uh, uh, look at conscience, you know, and uh, uh, the, how, how conscience in somebody with one can destroy you. Yeah. If your morality is, is you know, if you violate your own morality, you'll pay for it in, in despair. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, I'm curious, too, because, of course, now we want to package everything together. It's always the Val Luton collection. And obviously, he was a very talented, very gifted producer. 
And but do you also feel like does he or does he not get too much credit because he's also working and he also trained and and sort of groomed these amazing filmmakers like Robert Wise, Jacques Tourneur. When we think of the Val Luton House style, how much of that was his eye, his vision? How much of it was the input of these talented directors as well? I, I dare say it was all his vision. Really? Okay. Because, yeah, because the the letters that he wrote to his mother indicate that he thought very carefully about this style that he created just to contrast with the universal style of horror. He really okay. wanted to stand out and he really wanted to make movies on a budget that competed with the big budget movies. And there were big budget horror movies made. MGM made a big budget Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde in 1941 with Spencer Tracy, made a big budget picture of Dorian Gray in 1945, which Val Luton was somewhat jealous of. Very intelligent, very literate picture with an you know unlimited budget. And listen to my commentary on the uh, Warner uh, Archive Blu-ray of that. I did it with the, the late Angela Lansbury. And um, and he wrote that, you know, he really, what, what I talked about before, that he really wanted to straddle that gray zone between the supernatural and the psychological. The things that haunt us, are they, are they haunting us from another dimension, you know, uh, like the Swinburgians believe? Is it from a, this sort of mystic uh, fourth dimension that is around us and behind us and, you know, controlling us and watching us? Or is it us haunting ourselves, mm -hmm. haunting ourselves because of our own uh, neuroses and our own fears and our own, you know, despair and our own broken hopes? Wow. And those movies really do do that. And also, just on a mechanical level, he wanted to uh, have these um, sort of red herring scares. He called them buses because the first really effective one was in his first movie, Cat People, where uh, this long scene, this woman is walking through Central Park at night and she thinks she's being followed by something. And the narrative has, has led us to believe that this woman may be turning into a panther at night, you know, and she's very jealous of this woman who's walking through, uh, you know, uh, Central Park. And, um, and she hears this growl and this hiss and the hiss becomes the hiss of a, the brakes of a bus as it pulls up to the curb next to her and opens the door for her. And that crystallizes the whole effect of Val Luton. It's frightening, um, it makes you question reality, but it comes down on the side of reality. It wasn't It wasn't this, pan this woman turning into a panther, it was this bus coming up to take her home. But after the bus leaves, after the bus leaves, we see the footprints of the woman turn into the footprints of the panther. Now we know a panther has escaped from the zoo, but is that the woman and the panther or is it the woman as the panther? We don't know. Yeah. And that that question mark, you know, creates an une unease. And Val Luton does it at the end of The Body Snatcher. My God, did he dig up this old woman and it turned into the ghost of Gray to, to haunt him for his crime of murdering Gray, as in the Robert Louis Stevenson short story. And we find out at the end that no, indeed, it was the old woman, and uh, Dr. McFarlane was just so haunted by his his uh, dirty deed that uh, that it killed him. Yeah. Well, I'm curious too. So, uh, commercially and critically, how did the Body Snatcher? How was it received uh, when it was released? It got tremendous reviews right from the very uh, first screenings. Uh, all of the major newspapers gave it glowing reviews. And it, it uh, was Luton's biggest hit. And he'd had some big ones. Cat People was a very big hit. I Walked With a Zombie was a very big hit. But The Body Snatcher with Karloff and Lugosi on the marquee, with the reviews that it got, and also with Luton's reputation, you know. Yeah. This was like the, his eighth horror film, you know, depending on how you define a horror film. Mm -hmm. But uh, I mean, his ghost, is the ghost ship a horror film? Some may think so, you know. Yeah. Uh, but, um, it, it was his eighth dark suspense film, we'll, we'll put it that way. And uh, he, he had it down and he already had a reputation. He already had an app, uh, a reputation as one of the great producers in Hollywood. The, 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 the greatest critic, film critic of his time, James Agee, thought that Luton was, was certainly one of the great artists of, of Hollywood at the time. And he singled out both The Body Snatcher and Isle of the Dead as two of the best movies of 1945. 
Well, I'm, I'm certainly glad Luton got to experience some of those accolades in his own lifetime. And like, there's so many other filmmakers where their work's not appreciated until decades after they're gone. Well, it didn't make him happy. <laughs> well, I'm, it I'm, didn't, I'm, and and it didn't give him any uh, cachet at the uh, at the studio. RKO let him go anyway after Bedlam. Bedlam was a more expensive movie, and it didn't do very well. But uh, they were done. And also, the horror genre after World War II took a big dip because when the veterans from World War II came home, after they'd seen you know the beaches of Normandy and the the uh, the concentration camps. Uh, in Poland and Czechoslovakia and Germany and the, uh, you know, the, the, the horrors of war in the Pacific and the atomic bomb, two of which we dropped on, on modern cities in Japan, you know, they were a little jaded. It was, it was, it was kind of hard to work them up into any sense of, of fear after that. My, my uh, stepfather, the Colonel, he used to say every day after 1945 is gravy. And yeah. he lived that way. Well, I'm sure it certainly put things into perspective. Yeah, well, a dark perspective. Yeah. Well, uh, Steve, thank you so much for your time. Uh, for you guys in the audience, please check out his audio commentaries, his interviews on these amazing Blu-rays from companies like Shout Factory, Kino. Uh, here's the Body Snatcher Blu-ray currently available from Shout Factory. Warner. That's Warner. Oh, yeah, that's oh, Shout Factory. Yeah, right, they licensed stuff. it out. Yeah. And it that's absolutely. the Universal Horror Collection. There are... Uh, six volumes or seven volumes? Do you know if they ended up doing? There's seven volumes. On that volume, I did the audio commentary on the Black Cat and the Raven. And on volume three, I did the audio commentary on uh, the 1939 version of Tower of London with Boris Karloff, Basil Rathbone, and Vincent Price. Mm -hmm. And um, Val Luton movies, I've done uh, The Seventh Victim, Curse of the Cat People, The Body Snatcher, and Isle of the Dead. So you can listen to me uh pontificate further on that subject if you like and they're all very fascinating very entertaining insightful yeah. commentaries i'm a fan of them uh, is there anything else you're working on right now you want the audience to know about well i have uh i had a book come out last year which is called the mask of the red death it's in the uh um auteur publishing uh series of little sort of hundred page monographs on single horror movies i did the mask of the red death and that's out uh, my old book on um silent horror films i i think is still you know the the standard the standard survey of that it's called silent screams chronicles of terror by me and both are available on amazon and i have another book coming out in six or seven months it's called uh, gothic for radicals and it's about the um partnership of director gordon hessler and screenwriter christopher wicking on four horror films for american international pictures the oblong box scream and scream again cry of the banshee and murders in the room org and uh that will be coming out from bear manor in uh next year well steve haberman i'm certainly looking forward to it thank you so much for your time thank you all right, and for you in the audience, I hope you enjoyed this lovely evening of mystery and terror. Once again, my name is Ryan Bijan. I hope you have a good night.